Welcome to BookView TV. I'm Dennis Campbell. Now, each week we discuss the craft of writing books with an author in any one of a number of categories. Now, sitting across the Skype table this week for me is Trenton Oldfield. In April of 2012, the 158th running of the university boat race between Oxford and Cambridge universities was interrupted mid-race. With seven minutes remaining, both crews were ordered to stop rowing because a man was floating in the middle of the Thames. Seven minutes to go in this race, and once they get round this little corner here, which is still in Cambridge's favour, what's happened? Cambridge has stopped. Cambridge has stopped. Wayne Palmer, what can you tell We've us? We've stopped rowing. There's a man swimming across between the boats. Both crews had to stop. All the following boats have stopped. We've what got a someone shot. here who what thought it was a good stunner. idea to right swim across in front of the race. Fantastic boat race. That man is our guest this week. Trenton Oldfield served a prison sentence for his actions and is now facing deportation from the United Kingdom. In what seems a rather broad overreach to an inconvenience rather than a serious crime, the government basically threw the book at Trenton as he was charged and prosecuted under a 12th century law, the Public Nuisance Law. He's written a book about his experience, <clears throat> The Queen vs. Trenton Oldfield, A Prison Diary, and he joins us today from his home in North London. Trenton Oldfield, welcome to BookView TV. Hi, Dennis. Nice to be now, we tried for several weeks to arrange this interview, and I'm glad we finally managed to coordinate our schedules for this. Um, now, that BBC Newsnight attack dog style is a bit of a caricature, because no one really gains any insights when an interviewer bullies her guests as she did with you. So I prefer to start with something I saw in another interview where you discussed how protest is allowed in the UK as long as it's a banner with words carried for one day. But if a protester decides to take real action, like what we're seeing in Balcombe over fracking or Occupy at St. Paul's Cathedral, or you jumping into the Thames 18 months ago, is an entirely different manner. So let's first discuss the Crown's charging you under a 12th century law for a crime that looked really no more serious than getting points on your driving license or drinking in the tube. How disproportionately out of line was this all? I mean, well, I think overwhelmingly the response has been that it's been, you know, significant. I mean, it is overwhelming. It's massively, over, you know, it's, it's disproportionate. It's, it's, you know, kind of been termed as vindictive and um, certainly over the top. So I think not only myself and my family think that that's the case, but I think the general public now uh, think that that's the case for somebody to serve a six month six month prison sentence for a peaceful, nonviolent direct action is is worrying, and it sets a worrying precedent. Indeed, I mean you've been fighting class injustice for years, and and yet interviewers I noticed seemed very intent to trip you up on specific words. They wanted you to say that the UK system is somehow horrible and everyone else is is better, when it clearly seemed to be that you were taking target at UK the UK's hubris, much like. What we see in my former country, the USA, always saying we're the best without ever acknowledging any weakness. Explain what you were trying to say there. That's very interesting. I think you're, you're the first person that's picked that up, which is great. But um, you're, you're right. It is, there is this hubris and there is this kind of, if you, if you um, essentially create the rules, then you, you, know, you set the parameters or the, the playing field for, for which you then decide to judge other people. And, I mean, if you've studied just a, a minute amount of you know, British history or you know, American history, which is essentially British history anyway, um, you notice you know, the deep, deep kind of brutality that you know, runs through these issues. And I, it was one of the focuses of what I wanted to draw attention to was, and through, I mean, the protest title, if you like, or the aim was, you know, elitism leads to tyranny. And it was, it was this critique of this kind of, um, call it a theology or a philosophy or an ideology of kind of elitism where which is embedded in the culture I think here over thousands of years where well maybe thousand, a thousand years um, and 500 years in um, in America and other European settlements where there's this kind of creation of these hierarchies and these um, you know unfair playing fields these two tiers where you know some people suggest things you know like uh, we're better than others but you know they don't look at you know how they accumulated all that wealth you know through colonialism and basically theft and so it was yeah, I did want to really target that key issue and it's not particularly uh, sexy and there aren't that many other people that you know are working on that particular 
topic because if you're in the West, it kind of surrounds you anyway and you don't really see it. But I think perhaps because of my experience living in the colonies, living in Australia, being you know, a colonial subject and then you know, having travelled and lived around the world and having seen the impact of those issues, particularly on indigenous populations, I, I was acutely aware of it. Whereas I think in the UK, and you, you know in the um, prison diary, I talk about this kind of Stockholm syndrome, that after sort of a thousand years of brutality, the people in the United Kingdom have started to sympathize with their oppressors. So at, at some point, when I did the protest, some of the sympathy, even though this was kind of media-led, was with, with the oppressor, not with you know, myself. Um, so that, that becomes quite a fascinating thing of this kind of how brutality has created this pers personality. I mean, every other country in the world has managed to get rid of the British elite, except for the, the British themselves. And, and some would say the Americans as well, and, uh, but uh, that's, a, that's another issue. Um, give us an indication of how significant in, in your planning was the, the chance there to, to sort of embarrass UK police and security forces just months before the Olympics. Many saw that as a test run. And what was it like when you decided to, to jump into the water? What were people saying around you? Um, well, I didn't tell anybody beforehand because uh, you'll know the level of surveillance and the kind of the, the willingness of police to infiltrate groups and stuff is, is so significant. I mean, to the point where police in the United Kingdom have had children with protesters, you know, unbeknown to them that the, as an undercover police officer that they, you know, to infiltrate environmental protesters of all people, you know, they've gone to the extent of they've taken on dead children's um, identities. So the willingness to do kind of, you know, significant um, undercover work. Um, was so high that I didn't, you know, want to involve any other other people. But it was it was it was a combination of kind of what uh, I call guerrilla tactics, um, and trying to encourage that kind of methodology when we protest as a result of both infiltration and the level of brutality that protesters experience. So if you if you do do occupy or something, you you're likely to get you know completely pulverized by the police, or if you go on a protest march, you know know somebody who was you know nearly died as a result of you know being beaten on the head by the police so it was all these kind of different approaches that I wanted to communicate I mean the, the Olympics the reason one of the three main reasons I, I did the protest leading you know apart from the general kind of philosophical thesis behind it but in the three days before that the one of three main things happened. One of them was that the police minister, oh, I'm sorry, the Olympics minister said, if you think that your neighbor is going to protest at the Olympics, you should dob them in to the police. So in, coming back to your question about the Olympics and whether or not it was relate, related to that, it, was, it wasn't specifically related to that, but it was kind of related to this level of, you know, insane surveillance and, you know, threats from, from for this, you know, sporting event where people run around a, you know, a track. I mean, there was missile, missiles on top of rooftops, there was an aircraft carrier in the Thames, I think there was drones, there was 20,000 troops, the city was empty. I mean, it was, it was so over the top and so kind of um, embarrassing in a way for, you know, this kind of level, hyper level of thinking that, you know, a sporting event is so personal. But so, I mean, in the three days before, so that the sporting event was that weekend of, as a result of, you know, the, the other two things that happened was that they signed the bill to privatise the, um, the Queen had given royal assent to privatise the NHS and they'd introduced the um, data communications bill, which is basically, you know, what we've seen from Snowden, which would have legalised all the level of surveillance, etc. So those three things kind of pushed me from the riverbank into the river. Well, I mean, it's a, it's 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 a fascinating story, and uh, um, you know, when when I look at it and, and look at the tapes again, I, I think, okay, this is just a you know a disturbance. But how much did government embarrassment play into this decision now to prosecute you more fully than anyone else would have faced in a similar situation? Yeah, and it's, it's, it is an interesting question. I mean, some people have said, you know, well, maybe it's because you're foreign. Maybe it's be, you know, and that they find that particularly difficult. And I mean. We know that if I was, you know, black, brown, or Muslim, the situation would have been much worse than it was for me. I mean, I'm a white, middle-class male, 
So my situation is, you know, significantly different. I did have to do a blog post beforehand saying this is not a terrorist attack, you know, all those kind of ridiculous things. So all of that could be, you know, blown out of the water, so to speak, before it even came up. I had to make sure that all those issues were kind of knocked out because, but if, you know, if this, if I was Muslim, or if I was, you know, black or brown, it would have been very different. But I, I believe I experienced a, a level of vindictiveness, yes, probably because of an embarrassment or, I don't know, I mean, it'd be really interesting to know. Some some people need to ask them to find out what, why, why it is they're being so extreme. I mean, it is extremist, what they're doing. It's very fundamentalist and extremist, what they're you know, trying to, to do. Well, it's a fascinating story, and when we come back on Bookview TV for part two of our talk here with Trenton Oldfield, we'll talk more about that fateful day when he jumped into the middle of the university boat race and created a fury that still burns 18 months later when Bookview TV continues. Stay right here. <laughs>